So now let's use the expressions that we derived in the last video for the shear bending moment and deflection to make some computations of the shape of a beam under various loadings. So as our first example here, let's consider the beam I have in the sketch here, which is a cantilever beam of length L with a distributed load of a constant value Q, where Q would be measured in a force per unit length. This is nothing more than a cantilever beam under its own weight. So let's start with the shear equation. So we have dv dx is equal to minus Q, but minus Q is a constant. So we can easily integrate the shear equation and that leaves us with one constant of integration. So how do we find this constant of integration? Well, we have to consider the free body diagram for this entire beam here. So I have a load Q distributed along the length, meaning there's a vertical reaction here at our X equals zero location of magnitude QL acting upwards. In addition, we need to have a reaction moment here at the wall holding this thing up as well. But let's get to what that value is in a minute. So we know then that the shear at this point here, x is equal to zero, is gonna to have to equal the value of the, the reaction support. And you can go back and look at some of our videos on the shear and bending moment diagram to kind of confirm that. But the condition that we're gonna to to use is that our value of shear at zero is equal to QL. And so that has to equal our function here, which is minus Q times zero plus C1. So very simply or very trivially, our expression here for the shear equation Now let's turn to the moment. And we use the value for the shear. Now let's integrate this expression once. And again, we pick up another constant of integration. In this case, I'll call it C2. So now what's the boundary condition that we use for the moment? Well, we could say that the moment here at x equals zero equals this reaction moment here, or alternatively, since I know the value of the moment at this end, which is just simply zero, I could use that condition as well. So I can use either end to set the boundary condition. In this case, I'm gonna use the end on the right and say the moment, the value of x equals L, So now I know my value of, of C2. So let's rewrite our moment as a function of X. And there we have it. And again, you can go back and look at some of our videos on the shear and bending moment diagram and confirm that we've seen this kind of stuff before. Now let's turn to the deflection equation. So I need to integrate this expression twice. And now we pick up two constants of integration, C3 and C4. So I'm gonna need two boundary conditions on the deflection in order to determine what those are. So one should be pretty obvious, which is the value of the deflection at zero should equal to zero because the beam is supported on the very left and so it can't move. The other one is that the slope dv dx, again, small v, so the deflection, at x is equal to zero is also equal to zero. Because if you think about it and you go back and think about our diagram, when I support the beam in this cantilever mode, this point can't move, but also the slope there is fixed, right? So the beam bends no problem, but that slope there is fixed. So it's fairly easy to apply this boundary condition because now I just put x is equal to zero in this expression. And what you'll notice when I do that, I get zero, 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 zero. And so all the terms become zero except C4. So the only way the deflection can be zero at X equals zero is for C4 to equal to zero. Likewise, this condition is also easy to meet as well because I have the derivative up here. I evaluate that function at X equals zero, 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 zero. And that tells us also that C3 is gonna be zero. So there we have it. There is the full functional form for the deflection of our cantilever beam under its own weight. A useful measure is to think about what's the deflection at the end. So I can simply evaluate my function for the deflection at a value of x is equal to L.
So sometimes we'll call this total deflection at the end or the maximum deflection uh, simply delta. So there we have it, our first example where we can compute the full shape of a beam under a load. Okay, just to do one more example of a cantilever beam, let's look at our shear, bending moment, and deflection equations for a cantilever beam of length L with a point load applied at the end. Now, in this case, the shear is quite simple because there is no distributed load, so it's equal to zero. So dv dx is equal to a constant. I mean, dv dx is equal to, so dv dx is equal to zero, so our shear as a function of x is a constant. And in this case, the constant is simply p because that's the value at the reaction here and anywhere along the beam when I section it. Now I integrate the moment equation, so I have dm dx is equal to a constant p, so therefore I can very easily integrate the moment equation to just be px times some constant that I'll call c2. Now we need to apply a boundary condition here, so I'm going to use the condition that I know the internal bending moment is going to have to go to zero at the end, so I'm going to apply the condition that m evaluated at l is equal to zero. So you can see that tells us that C2 is equal to a minus PL. Therefore, our moment equation as a function of X and there we have it, the shear and the bending. So now let me turn to the deflection equation and integrate that twice. So now let me turn to the deflection and integrate that expression. So I have that our stiffness EI times the second derivative of the deflection with respect to X is equal to the moment, which in this case is P times X minus L. So let me just integrate twice. So I pick up two new constants of integration, C3 and C4, and I can determine those with my boundary conditions just like in the last example. The deflection at zero equals zero, and the slope or the derivative of the deflection evaluated at x equals zero is equal to zero. And just like in the previous example, when I put zero into this expression, zero, 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 tells me very trivially since the deflection needs to stay zero, C4 needs to stay zero. When I plug my boundary condition into the expression for the slope or the derivative of the deflection curve, zero and zero also needs to be zero, so C3 is zero. So there we have it. There is our final result for the deflection as a function of X. Just like in the previous example, if we wanna know what the, what the deflection is at the end, we just evaluate this function at L and sometimes we would call that delta. And what we'd find when we plug a value of L in here is we get the function PL cubed over three EI. So another useful expression. So now let's summarize our results for the cantilever beam under its own weight, where we consider distributed load Q, or under a point load, where we just have the point load P at the beam of the end of length L. So here's our shear, moment and deflection functions. Delta is the deflection at the very end of the beam in both cases. And finally, our formula for the deflection along the length of the beam, sometimes convenient to write slightly differently, essentially to factor out all the factors of L so that the functional form is sort of bounded between zero and one. So let me show you what I mean. So let's rewrite this function here for small v, our deflection. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out this factor of the deflection at the end. So I still have my value of Q. I'm going to pull out a factor of L4. And let's just go ahead and pull out that factor of 8 just for convenience. So now we're going to have this prefactor in front of our function being the deflection at the end. And all that means is that when I pull out a factor of L to the fourth, because of the factor of L here, I have X over L, both of those things cubed. So now you can see the parameter X over L varies between zero and one as we go to the length of the beam. So let's just continue. So 
So now as I have the deflection as a function of x, the prefactor out here is the, the magnitude of the deflection at the end, where this piece inside the parentheses, right, we see every term is x over l, x over l, x over l, in this case cubed to the fourth and squared. Uh, and so now this functional form here is bounded between zero and one. So just a slightly more convenient way to write it. Let's do the same for our uh, cantilever beam with a point load at the end. So again, I'll factor out a factor of P L cubed over three E I, which is gonna leave us simply with a factor of one half X cubed over L cubed And there we have it. So again, this functional form here is bounded between zero and one if I plot x over l as my parameter when I create a plot. So now let's actually plot these functions and see what they look like. So here are our two deflection functions for the distributed load and the point load. Again, our x-axis here when we plot this is plotting x over l, so it goes between zero and one. And again, the prefactor in front of this deflection function that we're plotting on the y-axis is simply the deflection at the end. So you see both go to minus one under a uh, distributed load and point load going downwards. And you can see there's a slight difference in these two functions, but they look largely the same. And this would be the shape of the beam under the, these different types of loadings that we would observe. And now finally, I compare our predicted shape to a real experiment. So on the bottom, I have a thin polycarbonate beam uh, therefore, it'll just sag quite a bit under its own weight when I hang it off the edge of the table. I'm just using my carpenter level here to kind of guide the eye so we can see how the deflection grows as we move from the uh, point where it's clamped to the table out to its free end. And we see the shape is pretty well captured uh, by our prediction. And if we were a little more careful and did a real kind of one-to-one -one mapping where we quantitatively compare these two, we'd see really good agreement between the theory and our prediction.